Hello everyone and welcome back to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson and thank you so much for taking some time to listen today. If you're new here, what I do is look at events that have helped shape the eastern shore of Delmarva. Delmarva is an area in the mid-Atlantic region that covers or includes all of Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. This is the second part of a series that covers incidents of violence that occurred in Salisbury, Maryland in December of 1931. If you have not listened to the first episode, please do go back and listen to that as it is very important that you have that information to continue with the rest of this episode. Also, to let everyone know, this episode will include details of very violent acts against a young man that was never tried on a charge but was convicted by people in the community who didn't even know him and who did not give him a chance to even defend himself. So yes, this episode will include discussions of death, but also of other very extreme acts against this young man, as well as another man later. So as always, all of my sources will be linked in the description of the episode. And this is probably the most sources that you know I've used compared to any other case that I've covered as the events that led up to this cover generations back even until the 1600s. So I do want to get back directly into the story so that we'll have plenty of time to discuss some of the um, statements that were given about 40 years later regarding this. When we ended the last episode, a mob of approximately 2,000 people had pushed their way through into the hospital and took this young man from his bed, still bandaged with injuries that he has sustained, and they threw him out of the window then drug him to the courthouse from the hospital. What the mob did once he was taken to the courthouse was they threw a rope over a tree and they hung him before there was any legal counsel, any defense. Even before he could really give a statement, he was killed. Then members of the mob cut his body down. They attached a rope to the back of a vehicle and pulled his body quarter of a mile through town again into a segregated segregated part of Salisbury and at that point they poured gasoline over him and set him on fire. So after they had already killed him they without mincing words mutilated and tormented his remains and nobody was ever tried or held accountable. Now I have mentioned that there were varying accounts of what may or may not have occurred on that day. Some will say that, yes, supposedly Matthew Williams did have a fight with Daniel Elliott about wages. There are other versions where James, who was Daniel Elliott's son, had borrowed money from Matthew Williams, and Matthew was confronting him about repayment. And Matthew did actually have some savings, so it could have been feasible. It was, these were savings that he may have actually left with Daniel Elliott for safekeeping. That's how some people think that the argument occurred, but some will say that James borrowed the money. So there's really no defined answer as to anything about the savings that Matthew had, other than the fact that he had saved up $56, which for the time period was, you know, a pretty good savings. And as Daniel Elliott and Matthew Williams did have a good relationship, um, according to people who knew both of them, then it would not be that surprising that he would entrust the money with Mr. Elliott. Some people say that James may have actually stolen the money then, that he had never actually you know, borrowed the money, that it was just stolen, and that when Matthew came to pick up the money, when 
Daniel Elliott saw that the money was gone, realizing that it must have been taken by his son, confronted his son for the theft, and whether it was because of fear or retribution that his son then killed him and attempted to kill Matthew as he was shot a total of three times. Now, all of these stories have floated around. None of them have ever been proven to be correct one way or the other. Um, So it is something that we will never truly know because there was never a trial first for Matthew Williams and for the murder of Daniel Elliott. Then things that may have come out in a trial for those that killed Mr. Williams, that that was never done. Nobody was ever brought to trial. So any answers that may have been obtained through any type of investigation were gone. Between 1970 and 1973, a project began at Salisbury University. As at the time, the students who ran the project did not get any um, waivers as far as publishing these statements. The university has redacted all of the names that are attached to the statements. So there's not anything identifying in them. But I do think the statements show a perspective of a lot of the different cross sections of the community. Even though this was the 70s and anybody who gave those statements, um, if they're still alive, they would be very old by now. But also, some of the statements were actually given by descendants of people who were at um, the lynching or who heard about it, or in some cases who admitted to being there but tried to distance themselves as much as possible. So sometimes the perspective is actually being seen from a descendant of someone who may have even participated in the lynching. During the time period directly after the lynching, a lot of the community said that the people who came in um, or that people came in from other parts of the shore and actually ran the mob. Of course, then there's disagreement about that, saying that the largest part of the mob was from Salisbury. We will see where some people unequivocally believe that Matthew Williams killed Daniel Elliott, whereas there are others that just as strongly disagree with that and think that James killed his father. Now, I did state at the beginning of the previous episode that we have to remember that all men are considered innocent until proven guilty. So the allegations that are being made against either Matthew or James They've never been substantiated because there was that lack of a trial. But reading through these statements and, you know, just knowing what I do about the time period from history, I really doubt that Matthew would have gotten a fair trial. Now, I do think there would have been people on the jury who could have remained impartial and listened to evidence as it was given, but given the actions that occurred after Daniel Elliott's murder, I don't think I would be going out on a limb to say that most of the people, or at least half, would have automatically assumed that Matthew was guilty. So to actually have him receive a true and fair trial would have been extremely difficult as well. And considering that one of the basic Um, tenets or one of the foundations of our justice system is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. It just shows how far justice was perverted, not only in this case, but in many, many others that preceded it, as well as those that have come after. I'm going to review some of the statements, and if there is any information about the age of the person being interviewed or what was their job, because sometimes professions are listed. So I will try to give those pieces of information so that there is 
enough information to you know, see the differences in thoughts and ideas along different lines. I'm not going to read through every statement or go over every statement, but I have picked a few and just going from how they were chronologically entered into the report or project, I will go in that order. And just a reminder that these interviews took place approximately 40 years after Matthew Williams was murdered. The interview listed as number one was provided by a man who was 27 at the time in 1931 and was 67 years old at the time of the interview. He was African American and at the date of providing the statement, he worked at Coldwater Seafood. This witness was actually at the facility, at, the, um, at Daniel Elliott's business on the day that this occurred. He had been up in the office to get a tally board, and he said that he saw, in his words, the boy walking down Lake Street. Now, later on, he does use James's name, so it sounds like he's talking about Matthew. And he thought that Matthew looked strange and that then James shot Matthew. Um, this witness does say that he knows that James could not do it because he saw James at the time of hearing the gunshots. He was, however, worried and did not say anything about being a witness at the time because he was afraid that the same fate that befell Matthew Williams would then befall him. So he didn't say a word about anything that he knew that happened on that day. So he was afraid of coming forward and telling what he knew because he was afraid of harm coming to him up to being killed for something that he had no hand in. And by by understanding this, it does show that others may have information, but were afraid to share it because of the same fears. In the second witness statement, the person being interviewed is 77 at the time of the statement, which would have put him in his late 30s, most likely at the time. Um, he was a security guard, and this tells even a different version of events in that... It states that Daniel had fire, fired Matthew and Matthew had returned. Then an argument ensued and that Matthew shot Daniel. Now, something that is not reported in every recounting, but is, um, is mentioned in many of them, is that Daniel Elliott was on the phone with another man at the time. Um, this man, a Mr. Chatham, was another businessman, and he reports hearing the gunshot, but that there were no words exchanged. So this quote-unquote witness statement that I'm reading right now is more information that was brought to this individual by hearsay. Um, also, memories may have eroded or faded during that 40 years, but with this section saying that there was some type of argument um, and he returned with a gun. Um, it then said that um, Daniel tried to get the gun away from Matthew, um, but wasn't able to, and that's when he was shot. So this goes against the versions that have him on the phone with somewhere else or someone else where um, it was stated that no words were exchanged. So that does cast a doubt on you know, this particular version, and it does show how, you know, some facts can be overlooked through the course of time. Then this statement seems to go even further, um, again, showing that either memories can change or even at the time when, when these events took place, that the actual order of events or what exactly happened, weren't accurately reported, or it could be a combination of both. But this statement ends with saying that, um, first, that Matthew Williams was in a security ward, which every other account that I've read 
said that he was in a segregated ward of the hospital. Also, most of the accounts that I read indicate that Matthew's room was on a lower floor, whereas this accounting says that he was on a third floor. And then the most glaring differences are that after it states that Matthew had been set on fire, um, that he was then tarred and feathered. Um, also, just to go back a little bit, it, it was stated then in this statement that Matthew was actually burned at the courthouse, whereas in every other retelling, he was actually burned within the African-American part of town. So that's a difference as well. Then it says he was tarred and feathered, and then he was taken to a Western Union office and hung again. According to this statement, this was done to set an example for others. So, you know, again, at the time of the lynching, this security guard would have been around 37-ish, give or take a couple of years. So... You know, just to have a story that is so far off from any other retelling where, you know, yes, every version is somewhat different, but there are so many different additions onto this. It sounds like the that some of the facts were embellished to make the actions of the mob seem, and I'm looking for the right word, but maybe to show that the actions of the mob was powerful or were powerful. Um, you know, by adding in all of this extra information, is it saying then that this mob had complete control over everything and took so many steps to, in the words of this person, to set the example? And if that's the case, that just, just when you think that nothing else could make it any worse at all. It's already completely cowardly of the mob. It is just shocking to hear some of the things that were done to him. And if we go by this and it says that it was done as an example, then that it, it defeats itself because Matthew had done everything right during his life. Even though he had to overcome tragedies, he still worked hard, was succeeding, had a savings. So in the end, if it was done to show an example, in my opinion, it did show an example, but that example was the extent that people would go to to harm another human being for no other reason than the color of their skin. This next statement, I think, is very telling because it seems to try to distance the person retelling it from the actual events of that day. The person being interviewed was 59 years old, and this is actually being retold by the witness's daughter-in-law, who does say that the mother-in-law had recounted the story before, but at one point did give more detail than any other time, and that's where the daughter-in-law received the details for um, her statement. So this person probably, um, I would say based on some of the wording, that it was a woman and her race is listed as white. And what she reports is that her husband delivered some lumber to the lumber yard that day and Daniel Elliott was supposed to pay him for it. Um, and that was going to be done at a later date. Now, by the time um, of 4.30, most people in the town knew that Daniel Elliott had been shot and killed. So the wife or mother-in-law um, got in their vehicle and started to head to where she knew her husband should be. And along the way, ran into him, picked him up, and told him what was going on along the area. She said her husband was very upset by the news and wanted to go to the hospital. So considering they knew that Daniel Elliott was dead, I think going to the hospital really would only serve you know, one intention. She did say the traffic was really terrible, um, which means that 
the parking lot, the surrounding area was filling up with this mob of people. And she said this occurred around 6 p.m. And she called it um, that people began to form a, quote, big party and that she could hear people talking about getting, getting him. So her husband exited the car and he, it says he went in the front door of the hospital. However, she next would say the mob was outside of the segregated ward. Then she does say the mob surged the hospital and threw Matthew out the window. So while it does sound like she's trying to distance the activity that she or her husband might have had in this case, you know, there is record that he did enter the door according to her statement. So at the time, the mob was inside the building, so we can only assume at this point, but to me at least it sounds like um, she was trying to distance her and her husband from this. She mentioned seeing Matthew's hospital gown, quote, fluttering in the breeze. It was terrible. She does recount a few extra steps um, in what occurred next with Matthew being drugged to the courtyard and being hanged and then, you know, his remains tormented afterwards. She does say, she says that she could see her husband's head in the crowd and that when they were done doing what they were doing to Matthew, when they saw another African-American on a bridge, some of them made the comment to get him as well, which actually caused the individual to drive off the side of the road and off the bridge. This woman then goes on to proceed to say that she will not buy the Baltimore Sun to that day. Um, her quote was, they were terrible about it. They called us everything in the book said we were beating everyone with hoses, rakes, shovels, and if they hadn't exaggerated everything that happened, it would have died down a bit quicker. So she's still upset with the Baltimore Sun for reporting what had happened is what it sounds like. The militia was eventually sent into the town, and I have seen this briefly mentioned in other recountings, but it wasn't really mentioned as a major part of the story. The witness then ended by saying, quote, they did leave town, meaning the militia, but to this day there are hotheads in this town that would take the law into their own hands again. So that mentality of a vigilante way of thinking persisted. And she had mentioned, of course, not being paid for the lumber for two weeks, which, frankly, given the circumstances that the lumber yard owner was killed, that there was a mob in the town that killed another man in a very horrendous fas fashion, and then even further, there was, and we'll discuss this later, but a third man that was killed, I think given all of that and with a militia coming into town, that two weeks, that's pretty good to me. Um, I understand money may have been tight, but given the situation with everything that was going on, she was still upset about the two weeks that they weren't paid. Now, I did say I was going to go in the order that the statements were placed in the project. This is one that I find very interesting. It does add some details at the end. Um, and one of the first things I noticed is that the age of the people who are involved in this account were probably very young. Based on the age at the time of the account, given in 1973, the person who gave that account was 62 at that time, which would have placed her around age 20 um, at the time that the lynching took place. And she was with her sister, and though it doesn't give the age of the sister, they were probably somewhat close in age. And the witness and her sister had been in the movies for a while, um, so they weren't really 
aware of anything that was going on in the town. When they did leave the theater, um, they ran into everything that was happening. They made their way to the, what I'm going to assume was the older sister's house. And, you know, they, they pretty much ran there because of everything that was going on. But she recounted that people were still shooting at African Americans. So if basically she was witnessing men out with guns shooting at black people. She and her sister got back to the sister's home and they started to let some of the African Americans into the house. And she said that some hid underneath of the house. So I'm thinking maybe a deck or a porch that was accessible. And so they let them in to try to get away from the people that were shooting at them. So, you know, these poor people that were being shot at had absolutely nothing to do with anything that occurred, yet they were still being terrorized. She then states that the word at that time was that Matthew Williams had killed Dan Elliott and had robbed him. But she didn't believe that because a lady that she had known for a very long time told her the account that Matthew had given the money that he had saved to Dan Elliott to you know, hold for him. And that when he did go and pick it up, that it was missing. That the older Elliot then confronted his son and his son shot both of them. Now, I do just want to mention here that there are many accounts that state that Dan Elliott was on the phone with an individual and that that person said that no words were exchanged. So this may not be fully accurate then, but this is where some of the information came about saying that um, Matthew had given the money to Dan Elliott to hold. She then does recount um, what was done to Matthew um, after he was taken out of the hospital. She describes it that he was thrown out of the second story window of the hospital. Um, she also said that they cut down the tree that was used to hang him um, not long after. She also said, and this does show again the mentality at that time, that people were upset that you know, a, a military regiment had been sent in. Um, they were in the armory, is where they were staying while they were patrolling the town, and that eventually, in her words, a lot of the men, quote, surrounded the armory and flushed them out. When they came out of the armory, the firemen turned their hoses on them. It was a mess. I had never seen anything like it, end quote. So, you know, I did say that I found this interesting because of the age group um, that was being described, that it was, you know, a younger person who, though living in a time where there was segregation still, where there were still a pervasiveness of hate in some families, but still you know, possibly working and shopping alongside African-Americans and their perspective may have been different than many of the older people. Um, it could also be, too, that her family taught them not to carry on that hate, which is what led them to try to assist people who were being shot at and letting them into the home. Though there were many reports um, I'm going to go through a few more with just providing one or two pieces of information that shows something new about what happened. In one statement, um, it almost sounds like there's a mix-up between what the witness themselves saw as, or, and also then the stepfather, which was actually there at the time. So in this retelling, the person says that first Matthew was taken to the jail in Salisbury and then later taken to Peninsula Hospital. Now, Matthew had been shot three times, and though none of them were fatal, 
it would seem he'd almost have to go to the hospital first. Um, this person then proceeds to say that ropes were made with the sheets, not that they brought a rope, but that sheets had been made into like an impromptu rope, basically, that they hadn't planned it. But every other account actually says the word rope, so I don't necessarily put stock in that particular detail. But this person does also go on to say that um, the hoses were turned on some of the militia that was brought in. Another lynching, which is very scary in and of itself. For one thing, the, the next account was from a young man who was a librarian in Pocomoke High School who was going to Salisbury to meet his brother um, when all of this started to happen. They basically left. They wanted to get out of the area and went to Cambridge. But what he noticed was, to quote, I remember how shocked I was at the amount of women and children in the crowd that night. So there were people there that normally, if you think of a mob, you probably wouldn't think of women and children being there. Um, it doesn't mention if they were actively participating, but still that parents would bring their children. Knowing what was most likely going to happen, that's just mind-boggling. Another statement does mention, again, as some people have tried to indicate that those leading the mob were from different parts of the shore. In this one, it says that they came from Cambridge. And also, it brings about um, some information, or at least one version of what occurred, um, was that James actually did shoot at Matthew after realizing in this account that Matthew had shot Dan Elliott. It also then indicates, though, that it was James who got, got everybody together and went and threw Matthew out of the window himself. That's the only time I've seen that being, done, being said, so that scenario was probably less likely. The person who gave this account does end by saying, quote, but as my father said, there were a lot of prejudices back then. I've heard a lot of people say he was innocent and a lot say that he wasn't. I really don't know myself, end quote. So this just really emphasizes that we will never have those answers, that the mob and their twisted sense of logic, and I'm saying twisted in a couple of different ways because that's really what it was. Not only were there minds and their way of thinking twisted, but the logic itself was too because if they were really after justice, if they really wanted to know what happened, they took that all away by killing Matthew. And this is the last one I'm going to review. And I did go out of order for this because there were a few things in here that I think are pretty telling. Um, while it doesn't say in the description whether this was a man or woman, um, terms such as her, um, so the pronoun her was used. So, of course, I'm going to assume it was a woman. Um, she would have been around 30 at the time when this took place. Um, she said that she had been home, was cooking. Her father came home and said what was happening. And she says, I was full of curiosity and I turned my supper off. It was cooking and headed for town as fast as I could go. It was dark, but my legs were really moving. When I got as far as Peninsula General Hospi Hospital, there was a mob there. So I stopped there first, end quote. She then goes on to describe what we've heard previous times about him being thrown out the window and his killing and torture. Um, she does say and describe that his skin was very scraped, raw, and even missing because of the way that he was drugged behind the car. But... In no way does this person condemn the actions. Does she say that she said anything against them? But she did go there because she said she was curious. And she went there very quickly. 
And this idea that someone's going to run out of their home and go to a place where they knew there was going to be violence just because they wanted to look, just because they were curious, is, to use a term I've used before, mind-boggling. It's something that I don't think most people could wrap their, their thoughts around, wrap their minds around that idea, because, I mean, to, to know what was happening and not do anything to stop it, or knowing that one person couldn't stop a mob, at least trying to yell for people to stop, to try to get them to look at reason, but there was nothing. She was just curious, and that is so upsetting that she or anyone could act in such a way. She then describes how African Americans in her term were jumping overboard, so I don't know if she meant that they were near the water and they jumped in. And she says that even though the Rikomiko River was cold, people were trying to swim to get to the other side. So this supports the retelling where the two sisters said that African Americans were being shot at, so they were trying to get away. And this version that this woman is telling ends with her saying that at the time people believed that Matthew Williams had killed Dan Elliott, but that later a lot of people started to say that it was James, Dan's son, who had shot him. And because Matthew had heard the shot or had witnessed it, he started to run where he then, James, then shot Matthew three times. So to emphasize the point here that no justice can ever be served in any of the cases because of the actions that day, this shows that this woman who was excited, it seemed like, to go to the hospital to see what was going on and then realizing what was going to happen and still followed along out of curiosity that when all was said and done, she admits at the end that now a lot of people believe that Matthew Williams was not Dan Elliott's killer. So these are many of the versions of the events that have been told. As I've mentioned, nobody was ever held accountable. Nobody ever stood trial. You would think that somebody would have recognized many of the men and had been able to turn them in. But even if there was suspicion or even verification that a certain person was there, that was never followed up on, that was never, you know, just never prosecuted. Now, looking through newspaper archives of the time, um, I did come to an African-American newspaper based out of Baltimore. And the date on this um, edition is from January 9th, 1932. So around a month or so after what happened to Matthew after his murder. And the newspaper article even goes back to another young man um, named Yule Lee. Um, He was also known as Orphan Jones. And on October 12th, he had been arrested. And at the time, between the police, judge, attorneys involved, he was given really no chance at a fair trial. It was described that he had been given a 16-hour third degree, which to me means that he wasn't interviewed or interrogated as much as he was either physically coerced at best, tortured at most. He was not allowed to even consult an attorney, so he had no legal counsel, which goes against the Constitution, as we've seen in the cases of Garfield King and of Matthew Williams, that even though um, Orphan Jones or Yul Lee was in jail, people still stormed the jail, and this was in Snow Hill, which is Um, if you're not familiar with the area, is very, very close to Salisbury. Um, So they did try to get Mr. Lee out. Nothing was done in any way to assist Mr. Lee, which is what I'll call him. 
um, going forward instead of going back and forth between his names. The paper then brings up another case of another worker whose name was George Davis. The unofficial consensus at that time was he had been framed to try to bring this fear to African Americans by showing acts of violence and just and to show just how far that you know the wealthier landowners and farmers would go to try to intimidate some of their workers. Davis had written a letter to try to see if an attorney from the International Labor Defense could defend him. The first letter that he wrote was intercepted by the jailers and destroyed. He was somehow able to get a second letter out to them and an attorney from the ILD, which is what they abbreviated, um, did come to court, did want to speak with Mr. Davis, but they were denied that as well. And there was also then um, threats made that he would face additional charges because he did smuggle out the letter. So Davis was left in a precarious position, and the attorneys, the judges, anyone that could influence the case insinuated that if Davis did let attorneys that they chose defend him, that he would get off with a lighter sentence. So given no other options and being pretty much coerced into you know, this, this position, he did accept the help of the two lawyers that were actually hired by what were described as rich Nowadays, we would say that is a definite conflict of interest because the attorneys pretty much were working for the entrepreneurs, the wealthier people in town. Now, I'm reading this and seeing this and thinking back to something that I thought of as soon as I started researching this, that first, there was not even a pretext of a fair trial, and even if it had gone to trial that you know, there would not be any following of the rules that people would go in with these preconceived biases and even if some of the jury looked at the facts and voted to acquit that most of the jury would have felt the other way and you know, at best it would have come out to a hung jury. So we really have to question even if the letter of the law had been followed and each of these individuals had been given a fair trial. It may have been fair on the face of it, but really internally it would not have been fair. I wonder if people were looking for an excuse to start a mob and to act fatally violent towards African Americans. What I mean by that is there were people looking for a fight, basically, that they were looking for an excuse to scare people, torment people, and it would happen at some point in time. It's just that when Daniel Elliott was shot and his son pointed at Matthew Williams, that's what people honed in on to use as their excuse. A couple of things in this article, though, is... Um, it does mention that the leader of the mob was Daniel Elliott Jr. I don't know if that was still James. Um, maybe he was a junior and went by, you know, his, his middle name just to avoid confusion. Also, the doctor at the hospital who was there the night that Matthew was taken, it is said that he did recognize some of the people in the mob and even went hunting with them afterwards. And the article does also question Governor Ritchie's motives. It sounded like going through everything with Matthew Williams's case that the governor was actually pushing for an investigation and was offering a reward, but it was an election year and apparently he wanted to run for president. So he was trying to keep everybody appeased, trying to 
quell the, the anger that was building up about these in, innocent men being killed without any proof, without any trial. But he was also trying to keep the wealthy businessmen happy too. So the article really does, I can't even say question, it does come out and say that Richie was trying to play both sides to try and appease everybody so that his bid for presidency would not be negatively damaged. I did also mention the International Labor Defense. Um, what they were, um, they were established for about 22 years, um, starting around 1925. And it was an advocacy organization that was meant to help those who may have been accused unjustly or didn't have the funds to hire an attorney who wasn't afraid to take on a case against those that were more wealthy or in power. While the organization could defend anybody regardless of race, they really did look at civil rights um, as an area that they wanted to defend. So eventually they did merge with another institution named the National Federation for Constitutional Liberties, and together they, saw, they formed the Civil Rights Congress. Now, kind of a downfall is they were aligned with the Communist Party in the USA, so that really did not help their defense, and they were considered subversive. Now, some of the cases they did work on was the Scottsboro Boys, and in that case, um, nine young men, young African-American men, were accused of assaulting, and there are some words that sometimes they don't want on, on YouTube videos, so I'm just going to say assault to white women. That also took place in 1931, and as we've seen, a mob did try to get to the young men. A mob was actually deputized, and once they found the young men, they pulled them off the train because they were actually traveling on a train, and they were sentenced to death with absolutely no evidence. Um, in this case, there was actually no medical evidence either. So everything pointed to not being able to really prosecute a case because nothing even showed that a crime had been committed. But on the words of two people, these young men faced the death penalty. While these events did not necessarily happen in Salisbury, which is where the episode was primarily located, it does help paint a picture of a time period and places that showed the strife of a changing nation with a percentage of the population not willing to change their minds or reevaluate their mindset so that they can realize that prejudices and biases can injure and scar a community. In the cases of the lynchings, the murders that took place this injures not only the individual communities, but the nation as a whole as well. These were cases of lynching where it took place because of a crime that someone accused an African American of committing. But there were always other victims, families, friends, who had to know what their loved one went through. Matthew Williams's family was able to retrieve his remains so that he could be given a proper burial. The local funeral director in the black community and some of the local authorities did go into the field where Matthew was left and brought the remains to the funeral home so he could be given that proper burial. The community lost out as well. Everything indicated that Matthew was a hardworking, kind, and driven person. He could have contributed so much, but again, that was taken away as well, and we'll never know what success he may have been able to achieve. And there was another man who 
after everything had taken place with, with Matthew, was still found. And his identity to this day remains a mystery. A Baltimore newspaper reported on December 12th that another man had been found dead. The police received a call on a Sunday morning stating that this man was lying near the lines that divided a segregated community within Salisbury. He was found near College Avenue and Railroad Street, and the description of the man and his injuries were made by African-American reporters who witnessed and looked over his remains. So there was no official, you know, really, description of him. Um, and then any reported information on him was made by African-American reporters. Um, the description of those wounds said that he appeared to have a fractured skull and that the left side of his face was fully caved in. On the right side of his face, he had a slash um, that was, quote, similar to a wound inflicted by a heavy, sharp instrument, end quote. Um, the exact measurements couldn't you know, be obtained, but it looked to be about two inches deep and six inches long. Nothing was found on the man that could lead to his identity. There was a ham that was nearby, as well as a slab of bacon. Um, I did see in actually one or two accounts that they said it was not a ham, that it was a sandwich that was partially eaten. This led most people to believe that while the man was just out grabbing some food, that he was attacked by people who were intent on killing someone for no reason. It was not defense. It was... A violent mob. No one came forward to say that they witnessed anything that night. And you know, after all of the indignity and the injustice that had been done to Matthew Williams, and now this unma unknown man who his name has been lost to time, it feels like this unknown man was even further victimized by his name being taken from him. After all that had been done to the unknown man, it was like there was one last thing that this mob could take away, and that was his identity. And, and I just kept thinking about him. I started to wonder, could he be traveling? And that was after I had read one account that said there was a ham sandwich, um, I know that a sandwich didn't really become more popular until later, but you know it's something that he could have grabbed while he was traveling. But once I read numerous accounts that mentioned half a ham, you know, I don't think probably that a person would travel a long distance with that. You know, I had wondered could he have been on the railroad? You know, just either working there or you know traveling. And when he didn't return home, his family would have had no way of knowing exactly where he may have gotten off the train or where he got lost. So they had no way to track him down and see you know, possibly what had occurred. But again, I'm, I'm torn on that just because of the ham and wondering if there was any way that he could you know, have transported that back to where he was from. That's, again, if he was actually traveling by train. And those were just my initial thoughts. But then we also have, on the other hand, that you know, even the same night that Matthew Williams was killed, that people were shooting at other African Americans. And I have to wonder also then, did his family, did they fear coming forward and claiming his remains? And... If so, I mean, that just shows the absolute depravity of the situation. And so I did reach out, and I thought hopefully something would be in some type of computer system about a missing person. Um, there are a couple websites, The Charlie Project and Name Us, and that's a website for missing and unidentified people. That's what they, um, a couple of the databases that, you know, law enforcement puts information into, but there was very few 
unidentified people going back that far. And, you know, none of it was in the right time frame, though. I reached out to police who did give me a link to an archive, but I couldn't find anything there on my own. And I, I did try to reach out to some people that I thought may have contacts, um, you know, or different resources that could be used to try to see if there was any way to identify this man. I think there I was trying to think of a 21st century solution, wondering if there could be any, you know, reference to databases that would show, you know, birth certificates issued against death certificates. But, you know, I can't really say how accurate that information would be that people did travel and move around and without computers to be able to keep up with everything, there really wouldn't be any way to search databases from 1931 across possibly multiple locations, um, you know, if the man was not originally from Salisbury. But also, we have to wonder if there would be anything that remained any type of evidence where it could be tested for DNA and if after over 90 years, if something could even be there. So while he doesn't have a name, we can't forget him. He was a murder victim, a man killed, and his life ended too soon for something that he didn't do and had no involvement in. And by keeping the memory of the events that took place, not only in Salisbury in 1931, but all across the nation, we can keep the memories of all of the victims alive. And if there are any that are unknown other than the gentleman here, by keeping that information out there, maybe someday someone will come across something, a picture of a relative who they've never heard about or They've heard about going missing at a certain point in time. While there may never be a way to have that definitive proof, maybe an understanding of what occurred may provide some sort of answers if they do fall within a certain time frame and location where it could be proven. You know, it's, and I just have to say that when, when I've had to deal with the death of loved ones, and even some people that were just acquaintances. Um, there was someone that I was just an acquaintance with who had a medical emergency and died very close to me. I never want anybody to feel alone. So it's, it's like where I know in my head that they don't understand that someone is there with them. But whenever I attend a funeral or viewing... I just, I want that person to feel that they're not alone and that if they had been sick beforehand, that people were trying to take care of them. It's just something internally that I feel. Again, I know, you know, I know that the person can't really know if someone's there, but that's just something that, that I've always felt. And so to understand or know that this man was buried and... He didn't have his name. His family didn't get to visit him. It makes me feel like he is so alone and I just could not and never will be able to get him off of my mind because everybody deserves their name. Everybody deserves to be known. And this is another heartbreaking piece of the stories of all who encountered these injustices. The mobs didn't have a right to take a life. They didn't have a right to even take one breath away from another human being, but they did. And in May of 2021, people gathered in Salisbury to pay tribute to Garfield King, Matthew Williams, and the unknown man. This was Salisbury, so it was the three men, not some of the others that I mentioned that were on the outside or near Salisbury, such as Snow Hill. 
The event was called A Silent No More. People walked the route that Matthew Williams would have been pulled down by a vehicle while chained to the back of that vehicle. They ended the walk at the courthouse and the memorial is in front of that courthouse. This was where both Matthew Williams and Garfield King were murdered. The tribute was organized and sponsored by the Salisbury Lynching Memorial Task Force. And going from an interview in the Baltimore Sun, um, one of the task force members, James Yamakawa, said, and I quote, The memorial won't change what happened, but issues a challenge to tell the truth no matter how uncomfortable it is. Not just the truth about who we are, but the truth about who we still are. And if we can tell the truth, then maybe together we can figure out where we're going. I think that quote pretty much sums up the saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We have to look back at the way things were and recognize how every event shaped who we are as the Delmarva Peninsula, as the Eastern Shore of Maryland, as a whole. If we forget past events, no matter how uncomfortable we might find them to hear about or to discuss, then what's going to happen generations from now when people don't know or understand that these tragedies and these crimes occurred? And I think... I'm going to add a little bit here, too, to say that for me, it's not just remembering the events. It's understanding the impact that they had. Anybody who can read a history book or hear something told by their history teacher or a family member, they can take in the words. They can know what happened. But to truly understand it, that's something completely different. So it's not a matter of just remembering the events. It's a matter of internalizing them and knowing that they didn't take place in a vacuum where they wouldn't impact anybody else. These events took place in public and helped to the hate stay a relevant part of society. So remembering and understanding will help us not repeat the same atrocities over and over again. Now, this is easier said than done, as we can see, not just here, but throughout the world, that history does repeat itself. And when it does, we as a collective recognize that. So we have to ask then, why isn't anything changing? Or why hasn't the hate and bias and prejudice been eradicated? And I wish I had a scientific or very clear plan about how this could be done. But I guess when it gets down to it, everybody is an individual. And individuals have different feelings. And unfortunately, there are some who have those feelings of hate. So we need to make sure that the voices that advocate and fight for equality or stronger. So I guess maybe I should say what I think may have happened. And there's two possible scenarios based on the information of the relationship that Matthew and Daniel Elliott had. It seems like they were really quite fond of each other. You know, that was universal from everybody who knew both of them. And considering there was someone on the phone when it occurred, that takes one of the scenarios that I read about earlier. It kind of takes it off the rail a little bit, but the closest um, retelling that I saw was one where it said that Matthew may have lent the money to James. And an initial thought might be, why would the son of a wealthy business owner need to borrow or take money? Daniel Elliott was very well respected And I can't help but wonder what if he didn't give his son an allowance, if he made his son work, um, you know, more for what he got. 
and if James felt like he was due some money and whether he took it to you know just use on frivolous things, if he took it as a gesture to to show some type of power, if he took it because he legitimately needed the money, it doesn't matter because it wasn't his money. So I can't help but wonder if maybe that one retelling was maybe slightly off. If the argument had happened before um, Daniel Elliott was speaking on the phone with Mr. Chatham, um, if the argument itself had actually taken place prior to that, and if James came in and shot his father, and I do just have to say to make sure I'm covering all bases, that this is my thoughts on what happened based on what I've read. So I would say then that the the accounts of the story where James did shoot his father, that it's alleged that he shot his father. But if he did, Matthew could have still been close by, ran in to see what had happened, and been shot in the process. Or he may have heard the shot and... You know, being scared, of course, as anybody would when they hear when they heard a gunshot start to run away. And one of the things that draws me to this is that a lot of the shots were, you know, while being shot, they were not life threatening. So the one to the head was actually um, kind of a grazing wound, and you know, that's why I have a feeling or a hunch that someone would have shot at him from a distance, that it was not as was said at a few different points in time that he had shot himself. I think the grazing indicates more of a distance. Now, being Daniel's son, if he had walked in the room when his father was on the phone with someone, the father may not have reacted at all. I mean, this is your son that's coming in and... You know, I'm just thinking of a man sitting at his desk. He sees someone that he knows and trusts come in. So he might just put up a finger, you know, like a one to indicate one moment or I'll just be a minute. And, you know, without knowing, you know, what was about to occur, the father didn't say anything and was killed. Now, like I said, that's kind of the theory. If we were to look at all of the other scenarios, you know, how to put things together. Um, and come up with some type of reasonable series of events. And after the senior Elliot's death, um, James actually, his marriage fell apart, and he did end up being hospitalized um, for his mental health. So you know, some people can really see that as him not being able to you know, handle the guilt that he had from killing his father if he did. So after, you know, reading through all of these events, not until actually last night, um, one night before I started to record, did I think of another possibility? What if it was neither James or Matthew that shot Daniel Elliott? What if it was either another disgruntled worker what if it was someone who was intent on robbing the place since it was getting close to closing time, maybe figuring that there would be more money on hand? What if there is this unknown third party that came in and in an attempt to steal money? Or, again, another third party that we're not aware of who may have been um, one of the employees who was disgruntled about something else. They and again, allegedly, shot Daniel Elliott. James comes in. Matthew also comes in, possibly from different directions. And in seeing what's happened, James thinks that Matthew had done it, and that's why he shoots at him. But still, we're in this situation where we will never know. Anything really is conjecture at this point. Things weren't written down and recorded at the time for accuracy. And as not one account was 100% like another, there will always be these variances. But I can end with what we do know. 
what we do know is that the events that took place in December of 1931 left three people dead. Two were tormented, killed. Then those who killed them showed even more disrespect to the remains of the men that they killed. They supposedly did this to find justice for a business leader in the community, a well-loved man, but they took away the justice. They perverted it. They corrupted every single part of justice that we have. Innocent until proven guilty. Right to counsel. Right to confront your accusers, which in this case would be the state. And then a defense attorney questioning those who were given evidence against his client. Right to a fair trial. All of these core foundations of the justice system were toppled over and destroyed and will never be, be able to undo that. So we should always remember and recognize the impact that history has made and vow to never go back and to keep moving forward knowing that our community is still in need of change and regrowth. Thank you all very much for listening to a very long episode as the second part of Matthew Williams and the Unknown Man and Garfield King's story and the story of all of those who were killed with no trial and no defense and no possibility of a fair trial. So with this, I will end this episode All of my sources, again, are in the description as well as my contact information. I do have another podcast that is kind of similar to this one, but it's um, not regional as this is. It's, you know, across the country or even around the world, um, different events that have taken place. Um, So I'll leave a link to that in the description in case that may interest you. Also, over the past couple of weeks, um, you know, I have seen some of the numbers and listens grow. And again, I just really want to thank everybody for you know, taking the time out of your day to listen to these stories, to learn more about our past, and in learning about our past, hopefully learning more about our futures. Thank you all, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.